In this video, we look at one of the primary responsibilities of the transport layer, namely multiplexing and demultiplexing. Let's get started. Now let's look at multiplexing and demultiplexing in a bit more detail. Reviewing our web application behavior, we have the Apache server sending HTTP messages to the client. And while the server is dedicated to this one application, the client has many running. In addition to the web browser, we also see it running Netflix and Skype. When the messages pass to the transport layer, we add the header onto it, forming this segment, which is then passed to the network layer, which adds its own header. And we gloss over the lower layers for now, but they add their own headers as well. And the packet is sent over the network to the client. But on the server side, this system is dealing with multiple clients. So in some way, it has to make sure that the correct messages get to the correct clients. And on the client side, it must make sure that the correct messages get to the correct applications. Within our server application, we have multiple processes, shown here as process one and process two. And each of those processes has their own socket. And that socket sends messages to a particular client. So we see the process to process logical communication that's offered by the transport layer. The transport layer then multiplexes the messages from both of these processes onto the network layer, and it keeps track of which is which using port numbers. The port numbers are included in the transport layer header, so they can be used later to deliver the messages to the correct processes. So at the host layer, we have an IP address or IP addresses, and that's how the network layer delivers the correct packets to the correct hosts. But we also need the port numbers from the transport layer to get the message all the way to the correct process. So each IP packet carries both a source and destination IP address, and each transport layer header carries both a source and destination port number. For both TCP and UDP, these port numbers are 16 bits long and included in their header along with other fields. So tying this back to socket programming again, when creating a UDP socket, the application specifies a port number, and that is the port number on the local host which this socket will use to receive messages. When the socket is used to send messages, that port number will be listed as the source port in the transport layer header. This means that when sending a message, the application must also supply the IP address and port number of the remote process because that information is not stored in the socket. When the UDP socket receives a segment, the IP header will already have been removed and it just checks the port number in the transport layer header in order to deliver the message to the correct socket. So here's an important thing to keep in mind going forward. UDP segments arriving at the same host and the same port number will all be delivered to the same socket, no matter what remote host and port number they come from. This is different from what we learned about TCP. So let's follow this through an example. We've created a new UDP socket for process three. Likewise, process four also creates a new UDP socket and the same for process one. So when process three wants to talk to process one, it uses its own port number in the source port field and the process one port number in the destination port field. When process one replies back, those positions are reversed. So now process four wants to communicate with process one. And we know that process four will use its own port number in the source port field. So 5775 in the source port on the segment going to process one and 6428 in the destination port field on the same segment. So process one is going to have to keep track of the remote port numbers for each message it receives so that it can reply back to the correct client because it's using the same socket to communicate with both clients. So let's see how this works differently with a connection-oriented transport layer. We were able to identify the UDP socket with a tuple of the IP address and port number, but a TCP socket is identified by a four tuple because it is specific to both the source and destination port number and source and destination IP addresses. So when the demultiplex process happens, the receiver uses all four of those values to determine which socket the message needs to be delivered to. A server application can support many TCP sockets, each identified by its unique four-tuple. To be more specific, TCP can have multiple sockets on the same local port number as long as each of those sockets refers to a different remote client. So let's see an example of this. We have our web server running multiple processes, each with their own socket, and two clients that want to connect. Host A sends a message from its port to port 80 on the web server. As we've mentioned before, port 80 is reserved for HTTP. This ends up communicating with process four on the server. And the server responds back from port 80 to port 9157 on host A. When host C communicates with the server, it's still using port 80, but this segment arrives at a different socket on the server because the client's information is different. And with a connection-oriented protocol, each socket can only communicate with one remote client. 
We can take this even a step further in that host C is running another process that communicates with the same server. But process three will use a different local port number than port two. So while they can both communicate with port 80 on the server, the server uses different sockets to communicate with processes two and three. So that's how identifying sockets with a four tuple means that multiple sockets can all use port 80 on the server. Okay, let's summarize. UDP demultiplexing happens based on the destination port number only, whereas TCP demultiplexing happens based on the four tuple, including the source and destination IP addresses and port numbers. Other layers have multiplexing and demultiplexing processes as well. For example, IP addresses are the identifiers used by multiplexing and demultiplexing at the network layer. That wraps up our overview of multiplexing and demultiplexing. In the next video, we'll look at some specifics of the UDP transport protocol. See you then. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you found it to be useful, please click the like button. To be notified when more videos are posted for this class, please subscribe to our channel and click the bell.